my eyes on here. Okay. Uh, according to Chapter 1283 of Virginia 2020 Acts of Assembly, addresses the ability of the soil and water conservation districts to hold electronic meetings without the need for quorum being present in a single location when a state of emergency has been declared pursuant to uh, 44-146-17 of the Code of Virginia. I move that the Northern Virginia Soil and Water Conservation District Board of Directors has determined the nature of the declared COVID-19 virus emergency makes it impractical or unsafe for us to assemble in a single location for the purpose of transacting business statutorily required or necessary for us to continue operations and to start discharge our law for purposes, duties, and responsibilities. I'll second that motion. Okay, um, so we'll do a roll call for this uh, vote. And Laura, we, you and I had a discussion about the roll call. It should be the board and other members of the TRC. And I might need help with making sure that I'm uh, doing that roll call properly. Uh, so, um, Okay, uh, we're all gonna vote. Uh, motion is on the floor. We're all gonna vote. Uh, John Peterson. Aye. Jerry Peters. Aye. Okay. Um, Dan Schwartz. You get to vote, Dan, because you're a member of the TRC, and so is Willie. Aye. Sorry, I was muted. Okay, you're cool. Willie. Aye. Okay, and Monica? Aye. Okay, did I get everybody? Uh, maybe Jim is all. Jim, Jim and Charles. Charles. Jim and Charles Smith. Well, I don't have a vote though. No, you do. I do. This is something that Laura and I talked about last week. Okay. Okay. Uh, I Are you in favor? Yes. Okay, all right, so the meeting has begun. Um, am I correct with that or does Judy have a vote? Judy also has a vote. Okay. Hi. All right. Thumbs up. Is that, is that correct? Do I have everybody now? Okay. Now, am I wrong in asking Monica for her vote? Well, we we can talk about this a um, I think it's fine, um, but okay. we, we definitely we can talk about this at our I um, clarify better. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. All right. Okay. Thank you. All right. Well, we'll we'll call it to order because I Laura and I had a discussion about this, and I think the TRC voting is different than the board voting, and that's what our discussion was. But we'll talk about it at the executive operations committee coming up. Thursday. So we will review the minutes of the November meeting, but I was just told that we will defer the review of those minutes uh, after further editing and review. So next up on the agenda, I don't think we need any introductions. Do you think so, um, Laura? I think we know each other. I think we all know each other. I want to make sure that I didn't skip anything. Um, CAP and VCAP reimbursements. We got um, Dan Schwartz and Judy Frazier up on the agenda. Good morning, everybody. We've got a couple reimbursements to look at. Let me see if I can share my screen and pull up uh, PowerPoint for you. All right, can everybody see that PowerPoint? Yes. Yes, I'm just gonna turn my camera off for bandwidth. Okay. So we don't have any uh, new projects to, or new applications to consider. We just have some completed projects to approve their reimbursements. It's uh, almost evenly split be between CAP and VCAP projects uh, this month. So let's get into it. We'll first go through our VCAP reimbursement requests. We've got two of them. They're both conservation landscaping. The first one is the uh, Margaret Kane Patrick O'Keefe conservation landscaping. This was contract number 21-2020-016. 
here's a couple before photos of their property. Uh, you may recognize this property. They did do also an infiltration trench uh, project on another part of their property, which has uh, already been completed and already been reimbursed. Uh, this project is a fairly large conservation landscaping project that had the intent of filtering and capturing some of the runoff that was making it down towards the infiltration trench and hoping to scrub a little bit of that sediment off. They have a pretty large property that's uh, at the corner of two roads, two older roads in the Falls Church area, and uh, those roads do not have curbs or gutters on the side, so they get... Uh, a direct uh, runoff from Beechwood Lane and Holmes Run Road, as well as runoff from their own property. The area that they were looking to do their project in is inside of their horseshoe shaped driveway. So that's their driveway right there. And on the interior of that driveway, they had pretty good canopy cover, but they had pretty poor ground vegetation cover underneath. So they wanted to uh, put in a pretty extensive conservation landscaping uh, between the area of the driveway to uh, stabilize um, the soil there. The total project cost was $8,500 and they're requesting $3,500 in reimbursement. It's an interesting project in that uh, their original cost came out as, um, uh, I think it was a little over 12,500. So they, uh, they worked with their designer and they were able to reduce the cost by close to, uh, it's actually, they reduced $4,380, but they didn't reduce the, um, uh, the footprint of the project, which stayed steady at 1,770 square feet. Um, and I bring that up because I know there's been uh, some consternation in some of the other conservation landscaping projects that we've approved through this committee that the cost per square foot was a little bit high. And this is a project that is a nice example of how the homeowners and the designer work together without our input um, to actually reduce the the per square footage costs. And they did this by taking out some of the more expensive shrubs that they had originally uh, put into their planting plan and replacing them with plugs. So they had approximately three, uh, excuse me, 500 perennials and they um, used more plugs to get the price down and they decreased the number of more expensive shrubs they had to 38. This is their planting plan. They, they wanted to basically uh, plant a, a wide swath or a swoosh of soil uh, between their driveway, totaling 1,770 square feet. And Judy and I went out the other week to take a look at it, and it looks pretty good. Uh, just to kind of show you the boundaries of the project and sort of see the different colors of mulch there, but that uh, lighter colored um, swath of mulch on the interior is the extent of the project. So here's another look from the other side. It's always a little hard to tell how these things are going to look when you're judging them in, in January after they've been installed, because obviously things are dormant and not growing all that <coughs> much. But uh, from what we could see, the plants were there. Here's another view showing the border of it. So it looks like the square footage was there, the plants were there. It looks like a nice project. And again, they were asking for a total of $3,500 in reimbursement for a total project cost of $8,500. Dan, this is Jerry. Question. Yep. Uh, are all the costs on this project for plants or the, some, some other work that was involved? Design work, uh, soil prep, and uh, the plants themselves. So, soil prep was what? It was uh, with mulch, but also they had to uh, clear out the existing area. There was an existing mulched bed there. Mulch wasn't a particularly high quality, but you can see from the color change, they put in new mulch as well, too, and made it a little bit thicker. Out and replaced it. Okay, thank yeah. you. Yeah, they did have a few invasives there, but mostly it was bare soil, but they still did have to clear and replace. Um, Dan, this is Jim, uh, and this is not specific. You mentioned the mulch, and so I thought I'd I jump in here. I notice they're using triple shredded mulch. Stuff does have a tendency to mat down and interlock and actually become a, a the movement of water and air in well encouraging them to use single shred rather than triple shred. Okay. I will Make a note of that for future projects. Yeah, and this is John. Following up on Jerry's question, do you know how much of the total cost was actually plants? Uh, I do not. 
Um, but I imagine it was a good amount because they were able to, since they were able to drop the cost by $4,380 just by changing the plant pallet, um, you know, a good portion of that must have been the plants themselves. Um, but no, it wasn't, uh, it wasn't line itemed out like that. It was more just a total project cost. Um, and I know a lot of it would obviously be um, the labor used to install it as well, too. But uh, no, I couldn't give you an exact number for the plant cost. Ben, um, this isn't exactly the question, but just for information, it went from $7.24 per square foot down to $4.80. So they did drop the square footage cost. With that, with that um, improvement, that changed the plug quite a bit. Judy, I, if, if my numbers are right, I guess seven seven dollars and twenty six feet with what Dan is talking about eighty five hundred uh, dollars and eleven hundred and seventy square feet. That's still uh, seventeen seventy square 1770 feet. Seventeen seventy square feet. I'm sorry, do it again. One thousand seven hundred seventy square feet. Seventeen seventy. Seventeen seventy. That's yep. more than that's more than seven twenty six. Final seven dollars and twenty six cents a square foot. Um. Oh wait. Well. Okay. No. Never mind. Dan, I have one question. Will you go back two slides? I just wanted to see. It looks as though this is the upper end. Is that right? Is this the high point on here? Or is it is it going? I'm just trying to get oriented here. Um, it's it's uh, across. It's pretty flat. What, what we see is up here where my cursor is. That's the high point, and then the water flows kind of perpendicular to that swath of of uh, planted land. Okay. So basically, so the the the, the, um, the driveway slopes down towards the house. Okay, gotcha. I just wanted to check this. This caught my eye. I was just looking at the edge here. I wasn't sure if there was a need for any sort of um, okay. protection or anything. Oh, I see. Here's the topo lines here. So it's this, the water is basically moving in this direction towards the house. Okay, thank you. It's it's not that steep. Um, so no, it didn't look like it needed any uh, on protection. It, it seemed to be pretty well stabilized. Okay, thank you very much. You're welcome. Any other questions on the Kane O'Keefe conservation landscaping? Yes, just a quick question from Willie, Dan. If you can show sure. us that slide with the topo lines on them, where about did they have the, the infiltration trench installed? Their infiltration trench is over here. They actually have uh, two okay. driveways. Okay. And yeah, if you see the photo here, uh, they put the infiltration trench where this big pool of water mm -hmm. is. Yeah. And this is the edge of their other driveway coming off of Holmes Run Road. So their core concern was to control runoff pretty much from Beachwood Lane that goes into well, their property? For, for this project, yeah, for the conservation landscaping project, both to control the runoff from Beachwood and also to uh, control the sediment. They were getting a good bit of uh, erosion. So you can kind of tell from the color of the water. Uh, on their lake here, mm -hmm. it wasn't exactly clean water, so they were hoping to clean it up a little bit, filter it before that water came down towards their now infiltration trench. Hmm. Okay. Dan, was most of the erosion they were experiencing coming from their own property or from a neighbor's property? I think it was mostly from their property. Um, uh, like I said, both Homes Run and Beechwood Lane don't have uh, curbs on the side. It's just a shoulder, so the water from the roadway does flow off onto their property. But it is an arched roadway, so on the other side of Beechwood and Homes, the water is not really coming onto their property. So basically, it was a runoff from the roadway spilling over their property and causing erosion on their own property. Thank you. You're welcome. Nice right. graphic, Dan. Thank you. All right. I'll skip ahead to the next one. This is the Alana Pettis Conservation Landscaping Project, contract 21-2020-012. This one is in the city of Alexandria. Uh, here's some before photos. Uh, so she had a property that sloped down from the street to her house, and her whole front yard was basically poorly growing turf grass. Uh, so the picture to the right kind of gives you a wide general view. She would get some water that would pond next to her garage and next to her foundation since the front of the house was front of the property was sloping down towards the house and the garage. 
And then here's a close up of the state of the uh, the turf cover, which wasn't particularly good. So she was getting erosion as well too. She had a pretty uh, ambitious project. She was going to remove and replace the entire front yard, uh, uh, eliminate the grass and create a very densely planted conservation landscaping project. The total project cost, and I should say this is just for the plantings and, and installation and design of the landscaping was $10,157.09 and she was requesting $3,500 in reimbursement. She was actually doing a little bit more work. She was replacing the front uh, walk as well as the front driveway. Uh, so it was a larger project than just the planting, but only the planting is eligible for cost share reimbursement. So you might see some other work in these photos going on, uh, but again, only the, only the landscaping was eligible for our cost share. So here's another before photo. This is looking out her front door towards the street. Those were her old steps, uh, which again are now gone and replaced with new ones. And you can kind of see just it was a typical suburban front yard, pretty much all grass. And here is, uh, she sent some good during photos. So this is a uh, photos taken during the uh, installation. Uh, they scraped off the grass, they mixed in uh, topsoil and compost on the site and they're prepping the plants right now. And this was in early March. And then later in March, here are the plants after they're installed, but before uh, the site was stabilized with mulch. And you can see the new uh, walkway there as well, too. Here's what the site looks like a couple months later in May. And then a few months after that, here's looking out her front door in August. I just wanted to bring in that first photo as well, too, to kind of show you how much it changed from before to after. This was a really impressive transformation of her property. Wow. So it looks totally different now. And she's also told us during the inspection that she's been getting a lot of uh, Nice attention from the neighbors and dog walkers and families going by on the on the roadway there. A lot of people have recognized the work she's done and has have asked about it. So it looks like it's a good ambassador for our program as well, too. Um, Dan, I'm, I'm yes. sorry to interrupt just real quick, but um, Judy and Dan, this might be a really nice spot to use one of those yard signs that we have, even if it's just temporarily. Mm -hmm. um, and just kind of promote the fact that this is a, a VCAP project. So. Um, if she, if she's willing, she or he, I'm sorry, I didn't I didn't get the property owner. Um, but anyway, she if she's willing, um, we could you know certainly invite her to to use one of those yard signs. Okay, I, we can contact her and ask. I, I think she would be. It sounds like she is uh, a fellow traveler. If you know what I mean. Good. How many how many square feet was that, Dan? Uh, let me check my notes. Uh, it's a big project, three thousand eight hundred eighty four square feet. Oh. And even uh, in December, when Judy and I went out to take a look, this was the week before Thanksgiving. Uh, no, excuse me, the week before Christmas. Uh, even in dormancy, it still looks really nice. So this is the dormant photo. Uh, definitely looks a lot nicer than, you know, half living grass. It's another photo from our inspection in December. So she's still got nice color in mid-December, mid to late December. And I thought I should throw this last photo in. She even planted the little strip of grass between the sidewalk and the street, which I thought was a nice touch. So again, uh, for just the planting project, uh, total project cost was a little over $10,000 and she's asking for $3,500 in reimbursement. Any questions on uh, Ms. Pettis' conservation landscaping? Looks great. Sorry, Dan. One one other question. We've had a number of rain events since that time. Has she has it solved her problem? Has it solved the the resource concern in terms of you know the the drainage at her garage and foundation? Uh, yes, in in many ways she says it has. I mean, she says there's still a little bit of water that gets down towards the front, um, but you can kind of tell from the photos here. Um, it was a pretty wet day when we were there. You can see the water in the gutter. Um, and we didn't see any standing water on the front. We asked her about it briefly, and she says it's made it quite a bit better. Beautiful. Uh, yeah, Thanks, that, was a that was a really nice project. Nice stuff. Uh, uh, now we're going to move on to some cap reimbursements. So these are HOAs and, and community associations. Uh, we've got three of them. First one to discuss is the Concord Village Conservation Landscaping. This is contract 2021-3. Here are some before photos. So uh, this uh, HOA uh, 
they have a kind of a privacy berm, if you will, along the back edge of a row of townhouses in their community. Just beyond the trees there um, is a, another a condo association, I believe. So uh, basically their property line runs right along the top of this sort of man-made berm in the back of their townhouses. Uh, the picture to the left shows what it looked like before. It was overrun with English ivy and other invasives that were climbing up the trees. So on, on their own, they had done a, a fairly extensive um, invasive removal. And um, they were looking to replant their, their berm with natives. And that's where they applied for the conservation landscaping. And it was approved, uh, I think, in September of this past year. So they moved pretty quick on this project. This is what it looks like now. So again, because we were out there and uh, you know about two weeks ago checking it out, there's there's not a lot of growth just yet because the plants were just put in, but we could definitely tell the extent of the project. You can see that new mulch. And again, it goes up to the very top of the berm and the other side of the berm is the neighboring community's property. And uh, they've got a lot of nice plants in there and, and they look like they did a pretty good plant palette in terms of uh, the growing conditions. It looks a little sunny now, but they have a pretty heavy uh, shade cover on this area. And they also have quite a few pine trees growing in the uh, overstory canopy. So they planted uh, specifically with plants that do well in fairly shady conditions and also plants that like um, acid soils. So we've got some American hollies. They put in some native azaleas. They also put in quite a few uh, high bush blueberries as well to to kind of uh, hopefully will thrive in those acid conditions. Uh, the total project cost was thirteen thousand five hundred dollars. They are requesting three thousand five hundred dollars in cost share. And uh, this was another pretty large project. It's very long and thin, but in total it's five thousand seven hundred square feet. Um, this is the original planting plan. One thing I like about this project is even though it's very thin, it's very long. So it actually has a frontage on a lot of individual properties. It's all in the common area, but there's 13 uh, unique individual townhouses that have a property line uh, bordering this project. So that's pretty nice. And the reason it's so long and thin is this area you see right here is uh, it's actually a, an existing French train and it's also the walkway that people use to either access their backyards, which are these fences, and also take their trash out uh, from the back up to the street during um, trash days. So they needed to keep that part open. But you can see, you know, the difference in the quality of soil and ground cover from this walkway, which is pretty bare, to this nicely mulched and covered uh, conservation landscaping on the berm right next to it. They are also hoping to, to uh, once this starts growing in in the spring and, and, and summer, to create a bit of a wall of vegetation because they have a lot of uh, dog walkers and kids who kind of cross over from the neighboring properties and have in the past beaten down informal walking paths over their, their berm, which they're hoping to avoid. So they planted some of the larger shrubs near those uh, informal walking paths with the idea that as they grow, hopefully it'll block them off with a nice wall of vegetation. Dan, did we assist with the French drain? We did not, um, but we have in this project, and you can see it right here, the small little blue circle here is actually an infiltration trench, which spills over into the French drain. Uh, we did cost share that infiltration trench. And as we were out there, asked about it, and they said they've had no complaints about it, and it seems to be working quite well. But the uh, French drain themselves, that was a project that they had put in several years ago on their on their own. Dan, quick question. I remember that infiltration trench. It was beautifully installed. And if, if you all might recall, there was a tremendous amount of um, utility lines, if, if memory serves me right, that they had to work around as well. That's and right. so it was a really great case study for um, how to put in these kinds of facilities in a, in a very narrow area. I, I have a question, and I know that we may not be able to answer this, but it may be something um, something to think about. Are they, and it has to do with the informal walking path. Um, my concern is they, even if they put in a wall of vegetation, they still may not avoid that informality of a walking path that's that's created. I mean, is there any harm in them actually establishing? an access point so that they don't have to worry about their plants being trampled? 
I don't think there's any harm in that. And that is something that Judy and I mentioned and maybe you just want to put down some flagstone. So if somebody is walking, you channel them into the spot where you want them. Um, I don't think there's too much of a concern because there was maybe one or two crossings total. And as a walking path is, it's only about 18 inches wide or so. So, you know, it's something they didn't want to have happen, but given the length of this project, if it does, if those walking paths do reform again, it's not, it will only affect a very small, small portion of the project. I think also they were considering some temporary measures to protect the, the new plantings until they're, you know, established enough to actually be not noticeable by the walkers. Milex and Double's somebody? walking stick were also good for that. <laughs> when yeah. they're trying to yeah. dissuade yes. walker, Greenbrier and Devil's walking stick work very well. Okay. And anything else that has big corners on it. Gotcha. I got the idea the uh, the management might be interested in something like that. <laughs> So then I understand the benefits of bringing in native vegetation to that strip we're talking about. Mm -hmm. um, but what's the resource concern that this project is um, uh, addressing? Uh, it was mostly bare soil and erosion. And th that is something to consider for future projects. It, this was a little bit, I don't think we have a, a solid policy on this, but in some ways they created the resource concern by denuding the hill slope by removing the vegetation. Uh, and it was bad vegetation, it was invasive. But the hills, the, the berm was fairly covered. It was just covered with English ivy and okay. other bad okay. stuff. So I mentioned that at the, when this project was approved and it didn't seem to cause too much consternation, but it might be something that we consider in the future. Do we want to reimburse projects that are bare or eroding or poorly covered because someone went in and, and removed invasive vegetation or? Uh, the only reason I brought that I was asking is because at the initial point, you, I think you mentioned that was a man-made berm. And I was wondering if probably runoff from that adjacent development was coming towards the backyard. Well, you, I didn't hear you say that, so that's no, what I was concerned. No, it wasn't. Actually, the berm sits up a little bit higher, so it's kind of like a little ridge of land between the okay. adjacent development and there. So people have to actually, it's almost like a speed bump. People have to walk okay. over it. Yeah. yeah, that's right. Dan, that might be something that you and the staff might want to think about a policy on to present to the board. Yes, I agree, because it's been kind of a catch as catch can up until now. For instance, if I go out and people are talking about removing invasives and then replanting, I usually discourage them from applying as a result. But at the same time, you can get some really nice projects like this as well too. So it's, it's I don't want it necessarily just to be my opinion, but so, uh, why some not consistency just, would be good. Yeah, I'm, a, I'm sorry. Why not just rolled in as a waiting factor? So projects there where they're denuding just you know, as opposed to addressing an active problem where there's there's limited vegetation or active erosion, fall they fall lower if they're simply trying to remove the bases, replace them. But it's still worthy. So if there were, you know, if it were providing appreciable benefit, maybe it rises up if there's not a lot of competition by projects that have a much more kind of a immediate need. Yeah, uh, is that was that Charles? Yes. Yes, Jerry. Yeah, Charles. Yeah, this this the subject about using the rating uh, criteria in order to determine eligibility. I I'm kind of a hardliner on this one. Uh, the the purpose of spending the public money uh, is to control uh, erosion problems and, and improve water quality. And you know that's not a rating factor to me. That's a qualification factor. If you don't have that, then you shouldn't be spending public money. And and I think that applies to this situation that I hadn't thought before about. If people, you know, take a bad situation and make it worse, a bad situation being invasive plants and ground cover we don't like, <clears throat> and create a, create a, an, er an erosion situation out of that, that's that's a complicated factor. But my feeling on ter terms of devoting the, the 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 purpose for the program to a rating factor, I think that's that we're getting into into soft ground there. 
That's well stated, Jerry. I, I agree with you on that. That's that's a really good way to summarize it, and I would agree with you that that sounds like. I think your point's well made. The potentially it's just a disqualifier, right? Um, so that's a that's a good point. I know we do have a, a a staff meeting to go over cap issues in the next month or so, and this is something that we can bring up and maybe brainstorm some policy ideas. But it, it may be just as simple as saying, like Jerry said, that no, if you if it's not currently eroding and you're going to do something to it that might make it erode, that's not something that we can cost share. We can't give you money to go back and replant it at some later point. Yeah. Now, this one's a little different because. It, it's already been approved. It was approved by the, the TRC I, I, several I months ago. Yeah, yeah, but there's no reason to, not to, to now say no. That's that's not what I'm suggesting. Sure. And not not to beat the dead horse, dead horse here. Then this is not uncommon. I've, in my experience with VCAP projects, I've come across conditions where people not knowingly but unknowingly remove invasives, and situation becomes so vulnerable that really and truly we should consider stabilizing if we have the opportunity to have such a project that can do that for them. I mentioned in, my, in our, one of our last staff meetings of a case I went to where the new property owners just decided to remove vegetation. All of a sudden they realized, oh my gosh, we have this eroding backyard that actually was going into a storm drain system just outside of the property. So when we get to talk about this, I think we should also be very careful about the potential of helping or not helping when someone does things that um, uh, they unknowingly uh, um, created themselves, problems that unknowingly created themselves. Okay. I wonder maybe we can make our decision based upon when the project occurred, when the removal occurred. Like for instance, if a homeowner comes to you and says, I wanna take all the invasives out and then get cost share to replant it, we could say, uh, no. But if they've already done it, like in your case, and it is actively eroding, and it was done out of well-meaning, but perhaps some ignorance, then then maybe that's a project we could consider. And that'll be a good discussion for our staff, our technical meeting coming up. Yep. Yeah. Agreed. Yeah, I want to just mention um, that with with our uh, program, and Judy and I have talked about this. Is every year we ha try to have some time in the May. May time frame schedule to review our current practices and our current programs and bring that to the TRC and really get these ideas so that when we roll it out in July, the new program out in July, we actually have some of these policies well documented. And um, that way we can be upfront with folks uh, as the program rolls forward, but we're always learning. There's always new things or new different ways of kind of looking at things. We do have some precedents with doing this in the past um, has some beautiful projects that are a result of that. So um, there, it's going to be a very, very interesting discussion, and um, I look forward to having that with with the team and hearing what the team has to say. We look forward to hearing the results. Yeah, I would also just be, note that I'm sure there's been what we'll probably see is an uptick in um, your homeowners trying to do projects around the home and not knowing what they're doing, um, myself included, being one of those. <laughs> so you just have to take into consideration that there's many of us who want to do something good, but don't realize what that they're not doing something correctly. And I think that that is um, certainly an interesting conversation to have, because especially during COVID and everybody's interest in upgrading their yards and homes and everything else, you could probably see, we may see more of this even. Quite possibly. Well, there any other questions on the Concord Village project? Okay. Here Thanks, Dan. Are well, we going to vote on, on these? I guess at the uh, regular meeting, right? We will vote on these at the regular meeting, um, as long as we don't have any hic any heartburn with them here. We uh, just as a reminder, what we usually do is we go through them, and then the TRC um discusses and by consensus just makes a recommendation to move forward with approval at the board meeting right. or to or if there's a need to deny uh or a, have a contingent approval based upon the need for additional information you guys we have the opportunity to say that here too do you guys have any consternation about any of the things that we've already approved and discussed for reimbursement 
I do not. Not me. Monica? Nope. I'm good. Okay. All right. All right. I'll move on. Sam, where are we at? Okay. We are at the Reston Association's Conservation Landscaping, another CAP project. This is contract 2020-3. This one was actually approved uh, approved for funding a while ago in late 2019. They had uh, gotten their, uh, done the, the structural installation in late 2019 and then, but we're a little too late to get the plants in. So they waited till late spring 2020 to install the plants. This is an interesting project. It is a conservation landscaping project, but it's a little more structural than most of the ones we see. Uh, this is the project area. It's a kind of a steep, but short hill slope that leads down to a parking lot. You can see the curb stops over here and you can see all the sediment that's being deposited. Uh, that hilltop was eroding. They've got a cluster of homes up at the top and all the downspouts kind of flow out down this hillside. The Repton Association had put in this sort of mini retaining wall and backfilled it with gravel and they're hoping that it would act somewhat as a um, kind of a informal infiltration trench. And it was working, but you can see it's getting a lot of sediment up on the top of it. And there was this whole other section of hillside to the right of it that was still eroding. This parking lot is also a Reston Association property and it borders uh, Lake Newport. So on the far side of the parking lot, about 50 feet away is Lake Newport. So all of this sediment would eventually flow directly into the lake. So they mm. were very interested in stabilizing the hillside. And that's the project area. This is what it looks like. Um, it was, let's see what the size is, 1,095 square feet. So it was about a 30 foot uh, length from top to bottom slope. That was about 40 feet wide at its base. And they decided to do a series of conservation landscaping terraces using bio logs or choir logs. These are fairly large choir logs. I think these are the 24 inch diameter ones. Um, and again, they put two 20 foot long ones together and staked them in. Uh, the labor itself was done by their own crews, so they kept the costs pretty low. So this is what it looked like um, in the fall, late fall of 2019 when they had the logs installed, but before they backfilled it with topsoil and planted it. And I'm gonna see if this works. Uh, this is actually, I didn't take good photos of it during its growth period, but uh, Ashley and um, our intern uh, this past uh, spring and fall, Meredith Keppel, put together a really nice video that we're gonna be using for a presentation um, at Green Spring Gardens uh, later this, this winter. And I'm gonna see if I can pull up the video. Can folks see the video now? No, let me see. I probably have to change my sharing. Hold you on have to second. stop sharing and then reshare maybe. Okay, I'll try. Is this for that. the Eco Savvy Symposium, Dan? It, it is, yeah. All right, so that Eco Savvy Symposium, I think is February 20th, is that right? It is in February, I think that is correct. Yeah. Let me stop sharing and let's see. Shoot, where did it go? Ah. All right. Now, can you see? So I don't know if this sound is gonna work or not, but at least I can show you the photos. Can, can you hear what Will Peterson is saying there? No. Okay. no. no. I'm just gonna flip through it. So basically what he's standing in front of the project right now, you can see a little bit of that biolog right here. That's the first level of biolog. There are the houses up at the top of the hill. Uh, We've had a lot of growth. So this was filmed um, September of this year. Um, they added both shrubs, uh, 200 herbaceous plants, and then they uh, used seed mix as well too. And their idea was they just wanted really, really thick growth. Let me uh, zoom through a little bit. So there's some 
uh, close ups of what the hillside looks like now. There's another good overview. So again, there's that bottom biolog. So it, it's really grown in very nicely. And in fact, it's grown in so much that it's hard to even see the biologs as you're walking by. They used to be very visible, but now you can tell at most of them, except for the bottom row uh, terrace is covered by this very thick plant growth. And Will, who's the person pictured here, the Reston Association staff member is primarily responsible for this project, has been saying that it has done a very nice job of stabilizing the hillside and they're not seeing uh, the erosion that they were seeing before. Let me stop sharing here. Um, everybody, I've got to go. Sorry. Uh, so far, the projects all look pretty good to me. All right, Jim. See you soon. You. Take care of yourself. All right. I hope hey, you can all um, see. Yes, go ahead, Charles. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. I'll bring my comments up later. Oh, just wanted to make sure that I was, you could see the PowerPoint again. Yes. I'm not very good at sharing my screen, so I got to check. Go ahead, Charles. I just wanted to bring up that um, I think this is a good project to not only is it a good project overall, but we've had a lot of these um, projects come up in the last several years where people have an eroding hill slope where they've been removing their leaves and, and, and the woody debris that's falling from the trees. And in a lot of instances, it appears that if they would leave the woody debris and the leaves, they could get appreciable benefit, stop the erosion, and maybe at, at low to no cost. Uh, bring about stability on that hillside. The addition of plantings is certainly uh, a benefit, but I think this is a good example of using basically mimicking nature. Um, here, I would argue you've probably just gotten away with the coir logs and let the leaves accumulate, similar to behind logs on a typical hill slope. Um, but the plantings certainly have an attractive component, a wildlife benefit component, and an active rooting component that are real positive. So I think it's just a really good one to keep in your back pocket as an example to people, things they can do, and that they may not have to spend so much money or have a lot of forethought to it, but it's um, it's a really good example of hill slope stability. Yep. This this project was a little bit unusual too in that it's Reston Association property, but you can see it, it butts up right against someone's backyard. And I think one of the issues they were having is that the homeowners Purposefully or not, they weren't sure we're, we're clearing the hillside because they wanted to keep a nice view of the lake from their property. And I, I think a lot of it was probably ignorance. They weren't sure where their property ended and the Reston associations began. Um, so the, the, the Reston's plan is to keep this as natural as possible and just let things lie. Um, so they, they, it's not going to be a, a kind of a highly maintained uh, project. It's more meant to just grow naturally and, and grow wild, like you said, Charles. So, Dan, just a quick question. Was this sure. a um, common ground area where the barrel logs were used? Yes. Or was so it private a, property? It's it's common area. It's actually a rest and association property. Hmm. Now, so the re reason I asked that is just to further um, Charles's suggestion that yes, with the biologs, you can put it there and they would serve the practical purpose of stabilization. However, I see how property owners can object to the visual of it, the aesthetics of it. If it's not planted, which is a quick fix, then to just have this biologs laying on the steep slope. And um, even though it's serving similar purpose. Mm -hmm. Yep. And this. This was a nice project too, and that I think it worked very well, but it was also pretty cost effective, um, mostly because Reston did all of the design and, and installation work themselves because they have their own crews. So the total project cost was only $2,174 and their reimbursement amount would therefore be $1,630.50. Are there any other questions or comments about this project? I like these right, projects, that's good. That must have just been the cost of the biologs. Uh, it was somewhat the cost of uh, the uh, plant. Now, plants and labor were included in there as well, too. I'm not sure how they kept the cost down so much, but wow. I think they did use fairly inexpensive plants, and a lot of the plantings they did was that seed mix, which doesn't cost very much at all. 
I think that's that's a big cost savings is the use of the seed mix. And of course, depending upon where they where they got their seed mix from. Um, and, and I'm sorry, I don't know the, the details on that myself, but there's that is a um, I think a, a, a nice way of being able to manage an area like that and get the benefits. I think that both Willie and, and you were talking about Dan in terms of trying to create some um, visual appeal to it. I, I guess one question I have, and, and maybe Charles, you might be uh, interested in answering this too, is, is there any invasive pressure here? Is, is Do they tend, are they intending to come out and take a look at this or are they gonna just allow it to naturalize? Because I could imagine maybe some invasive pressures in this area. The beauty of Wet Rest and Association is they have very active management and will will likely monitor this site um, for, you know, I imagine for several years at least. The the answer on the invasives really has to do with the surrounding um, seed grain of invasive species. So if you have a lot of invasive source, it certainly could be a lot of pressure. From the pictures, it doesn't appear to be that that could be misleading. Um, so I guess it really depend on the situation, Laura. And I do agree with you that I think monitoring it to pull invasives as they start to sprout is an important thing. Um, and there are certainly some good guides to invasives so people don't have to be the most knowledgeable person in order to prevent it from becoming a tangled you know, mess over a couple of years if invasives really start to set in. I, w I looked up the um, the invoices and it's about five hundred dollars of plant materials and thirteen eighty about fourteen hundred dollars of the log and the um, and the you know, states that hold them in there. Yeah, I think in reviewing when when uh, when staff gets together and talks about the program and eligibility, uh, the viability of a project like this. Uh, compared to some of these places where we're spending eight to ten dollars, somebody's spending eight to ten dollars a square foot for potted plants. Um, I think we need to think about that. We also need to think about the, the question that we're talking about now, and that is invasive control. What's what's the potential for for these sites to become messes that people come in and clear, you know, in three years because it looks bad, and and we end up with a they need a project again. How do we how do we get on top of the invasives? I don't, I don't see any. I understand this stuff out there, uh, information available, uh, as Charles says. But man, getting people to do it. Something Each else. of these projects have um, spot checks. Am I right, Dan? How often are you required to do those spot checks? Uh, well, there's always there's a random chance. I think we we draw twenty five percent of the projects each year to spot check. Okay. So, um, and that's over the 10 year maintenance span. And for these conservation landscapings, one of the things on the spot check, spot check checklist is <laughs> say that three um, times <laughs> is uh, invasive control. So if oh. it's overrun by invasives. We can tell them that they need to fix it or potentially lose their funding. Do, do we have much of a track record now on those inspections that we can look at the conservation landscaping and see how people are doing? Yeah, yeah. We, we've got you know a couple years worth now. I'd, I'd like to see the results because um, I know in, in dealing with my local citizen association and my own property, um, turning, a, turning some ground into natural landscaping is one thing. Thinking about it that is totally something else. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I a lot of volunteer labor. I want to just also mention, I think that this is another good um, item for perhaps our policy document is inspecting these sort of seed mix um, conservation landscaping sites, because there's usually a wide variety of, that's in, included in the seed mix. Um, and so just that may be just something to, to sort of take a look at. And I know that MSMD, the Maintenance and Stormwater Management Division, also has some guidelines in terms of looking at um, projects that have used seed mix um, as an alternative, but I think you're I think you're spot on um, with taking a look and seeing what we can understand from the inspections. Yeah. Um, but also, Judy and I have talked about this. Is there is 
there's an opportunity for added communication and more frequent communication with some of these these property owners. Each application does have a maintenance agreement associated with it, but also it's a requirement of the property owners to document how they are going to maintain these facilities into the longer term. So we really want them to be thinking about maintenance upfront. And um, so that is reviewed by by staff. And if there's a need for for tweaking or, or anything like that, um, they, they can provide our, our team can provide that input at that time, too. But I, I think we're getting into the motion of um, especially starting in, in FY21 with um, being more frequent with our communication and in, and helping um, the property owners to just even if it's just a quick reminder, hey, now's a great time to go and check for these invasives. Here's the common ones that we have in our area, for example. Um, I, think, so. I think to the extent that that's successful, if we can if we can take some projects where people have done a good job of of uh, maintaining and, and and checking for invasives, that we could come up with this you know a a how to do it guide for people say hey here's what people have done that's been successful and it's not onerous. I'm not sure that's the conclusion we're going to come to, but it'd be nice to be able to you know, put some guidance out there and, and not just ask for a plan. Well, we need to ask. We need to ask for maintenance plan too. Don't get me wrong, but I like. I think the more the more we can hold people's hands and get them ready and show them how to do it, the better off the project's going to be in the long term. Have we go back, uh, Laura, to any any pre-existing projects and and cancel the funding because they didn't take care of them? Do we have any experience with that? No, not we we do not have any experiences with that. Um, it's been our experience if we have had some that look as though they need to um, do a little little cleanup, um, we provide them with that information. And usually it, it, it you know we haven't had any major failures essentially um, when it comes to to these projects. so that's that's a good thing. And uh, as I understand it, um, you know, with uh, just just anecdotally hearing from Christina again, the the point is to try to keep these projects in the system and and keep them looking nice and and functional, and so uh, that's the guidance that she's been providing to them. So perhaps a few plants need to be replanted here and there, but it doesn't sound as though there's been a any sort of um, challenges from the property owners. Gotcha. Thank you. I, yeah, I think what our, our spot checks really are, are it's a corrective. Uh, if we find anything wrong, uh, the standard form asks us to note it down, send that information to the homeowner, and then they have 90 days to, to correct it. So we're trying not to get anybody in trouble. We're really just trying to get the issues fixed. No, I, I hope, hopefully we're not in the mode of punishing, but in the mode of learning. Right and and passing it on to to future project uh, uh, recipients. And while we were talking, I saw that uh, Maria shared a good uh, invasives control guide from the Park Authority, which should be in uh, the chat box of this of this meeting. So maybe that's something that we can pass out. All right. Any other questions on the Rest and Association Choir Log project? Hearing none, I'll move to our last one, which is actually an energy project. Um, St. Peter's in the Woods Episcopal Church in Fairfax Station, contract number 2020-8. They had broken their, it, it was a big project. They were doing small things, but a lot of small things around the, uh, uh, the sanctuary. Um, they kind of broke it down into three parts. Part one was an appliance upgrade. Part two was a lighting upgrade. And part three was an insulation ceiling upgrade. So I'll start with part one. They had uh, some old appliances. The, the church is not that old. It was built in the late 90s and the appliances looked like they were original to that time. None of them were Energy Star rated. So they had two late 90s era dishwashers and then this old warhorse over here, an old Amana refrigerator uh, that they wanted to upgrade with new Energy Star rated replacements. And they did. So there's their two, uh, I think they're all Whirlpool, I believe, brand. Um, so they bought them and installed them. 
they all the biggest part of the project was lighting they had uh we're replacing 250 t8 bulbs t8 are those old standard um, fluorescent ceiling bulbs that you see on on most drop down type ceilings um and they're replacing in addition to that which is basically all of the bulbs on the interior spaces of their um, classrooms and in the non-sanctuary part of the building they were also replacing uh, some larger metal halide bulbs out in the parking lot, both the major bulbs that were shining down on the parking area and also uh, some smaller uh, lighting bulbs that were highlighting or, or, or illuminating the walkways from the parking lot to the church. Uh, it was a little bit more of an involved project. The interior stuff, they, the uh, congregation members did all the work themselves. The exterior ones, they had to change the ballast so they had an electrician out there doing that work for them. Um, so again, there was 250 T8 bulbs that they were replaced with um, LED and 12 metal halide exterior bulbs that they also replaced with LED. Um, their estimates are that they will see a 50% energy reduction as a result of these replacements, and that should save the church around $1,300 annually. Um, they got these numbers because they did their own energy audit using infrared uh, cameras beforehand, so they did quite a bit of prep work. Uh, before they uh, put in their application. They also did some new ceiling on, uh, well, weather stripping really on windows and on their front and rear entrance doors. They had two windows uh, behind the altar on in their sanctuary, and you can see there was a fairly large gap uh, that was letting in a lot of cold air and a lot of hot air out. Uh, they had to get those professionally repaired, so they got two new windows installed uh, in replace of these broken ones and then they did uh, some good weather stripping around their entrance and exit doors that they and they did that work themselves in total between all three of these projects their total project cost was five thousand nine hundred sixty one dollars and seventy nine cents so they made a pretty good use of the money i think they uh they they got a pretty good value and with uh cap energy projects they are reimbursable up to 50% of the cost. So they're asking for $2,980.90 in reimbursement, which is actually a little less than what we approved because their total costs came in a little less than their expected budget. So it's a couple hundred dollars less than what we thought we'd be paying out in cost share for this. Any questions about St. Peter's in the Woods? That's a great return on that investment. Especially if they're going to be saving $1,300 in energy costs just on the lighting. Uh, this, this will pay for itself in probably a year or two, um, given that they'll also see some savings from, obviously, the insulation and the new appliances that they installed as well. I think this would be a great one to share with the um, Office for Environmental and Energy Coordination um, as an example of what, you know, their, uh, what is being done in some of these places of worship. Um, and examples of how they were able to reduce costs by engaging the congregation. That's, that's pretty neat. It is a cool project and they seem, uh, you know, even beyond these projects, um, they seem very involved in their environment. They've got a nice property I mean, as the name implies St. Peter's in the woods. They've got a lot of uh, wooded property at the church um, and they're looking to do some erosion control on their own. Uh, and they also have a, uh, uh, a pollinator garden in the front that they installed on their own, not through help of the CAP program. So they're doing a lot of interesting environmental stuff at the sanctuary, in addition to energy upgrade. Yeah, that'd be good if they could take the cost savings they've already calculated for the uh, ceiling lights and add in the other cost savings from the energy efficient appliances and these outdoor lights and be able to say, you know, our return on investment is, you know, 2.3 years. That's that's that could be hard data to some yep. other people. Yep, I, I will certainly ask them. They said they'd be willing that, that they're hoping to monitor pretty closely to see what their numbers are. Yeah, and I'm, hopefully great. they'll share that with us. A couple of years ago, you all might recall we there was an, a similar project that was done at a large um, a large church. I can't recall the exact name of it, but um, where they went in and they installed all. Um, um, you know, the LED lights and and uh, and things like that throughout their throughout their building, and they actually provided us copies of their um, their energy bill, and 
what it was the year before and then what it was roughly a month after they had installed um, all of these new fixtures. And it was a 50% reduction on their overall energy bill. So, I mean, it's it really does make a, a pretty significant difference. And um, maybe that's again, Judy and 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 Dan. Um, you know, there's there's some opportunity to reach out, especially Judy, as you're getting to know some of these um, and getting familiar with some of these past projects. That might be a really nice way of just being able to engage them and getting some of that that information to help share the story about the value of this program and the value of these projects to these different um, facilities. And I think the folks there would be great ambassadors too. They were very, um, I mean, they got very involved in it and very knowledgeable. And I mean, they have the tools and know how to go forward if they need to do further repairs or, or whatever. So it's a really great example too of, of the sort of stewardship um, that the community there has taken on. I do. The only thing that, uh, as far as getting data from them, will be a little tough just because of the year, because of COVID, they haven't been in the building very much, so <laughs> it won't be a standard baseline. But we could probably, if they have the data from a year or two ago, we could compare that with a, a future, actual, you know, real year for them. Well, that is the last project for consideration today. So we've got those two VCAP projects, um, the Kane O'Keefe Conservation Landscaping, the Pettis Conservation Landscaping, and the three CAP projects, Reston Association, Concord Village, and St. Peter's in the Woods. So if it's recommended for approval, we'll bring all of these uh, for the final reimbursement uh, vote at the board meeting this month. Thank you, Dan. Are there any questions, folks? I don't have any, Adri. I think uh, we can bring them all to the board. I, I agree. agree. I agree. And I just have a, a quick question. I'm sorry. Um, go ahead, Adria. Excuse me. Yep. No, I'm good. Thank you so much. Okay. Good, Laura. I'm I'm sorry to have interrupted. Um, Dan and Judy, I was just. Um, would it be possible to get these projects in the little tabular form? Um, that we've, we've presented in the past as well, just so that I can incorporate it into the the TRC report in minutes. Uh, yes, the, the word document, just a little table. Yep, exactly. Yep. Great, thank you. You're welcome. All right, well, I will stop sharing. Okay. Head back to the meeting. Thank you, Dan. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Um, we, that was the only thing that we had on the agenda. There's a, on the agenda, you'll see that the listed are the upcoming um, meetings uh, for, for 2021. Um, and that we may change to an earlier start time if we have more uh, for February um, coming up. Um, Dan, do you have a lot, anything on the boilerplate or Willie that we should, um, you feel like maybe we should say that we might meet earlier next month or do you think 10 o'clock might be okay? We don't have any, uh, of our 2021 VCAP applications in yet. Okay. We are hoping to see a surge of them. If you remember early last year, before everything shut down, we had, you know, 15 or so projects to consider in January and about the same number in February. We're expecting that they'll start rolling in soon because the site visits were all conducted and you know, wrapped up in December. But as of now, we haven't received any of those new applications just yet, but we are expecting them. So right now, I think we can schedule it for 10 um, with the understanding that we might get a little bit of a deluge later in this month of new applications. Okay. Also, the difference from last year was that the program had a deadline of December 15th or 16th for the applications. This year, we're um, letting them come in through March. So okay. that surge may come later in the spring. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Okay. Adrian, this is just one person's uh, opinion, but if we have to start, I'd sooner start earlier than go later. Okay. I'm fine with that. Um, Willie, you were starting to say uh, something? Yes, I was just going to say I'm in line with Dan. I'm already having some 
uh, feedback from um, sites that I reviewed for VCAMP and they were having some very interesting uh, um, questions from me suggesting that they're looking forward to progress with giving submitting their forms one and two. Um, that's for VCAP. And when it comes to cost share, Laura and I traded some information um, about a week or two ago that yes, our our cost share program, uh, potential cost share cooperators are either on hold because of economic situation due to COVID or have actually changed the land use practices. One specific one is the is the May property that had those. X number of 70 goats and cows and the and the huge five acre pond, the property owners lately got rid of all of their animals. So that the, the proposed cost share doesn't stand for what they have now. They're going into more um, vegetable production, organic production, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, their, their whole perspective has changed. But should we have follow up from the other two guys, the other two operations, the Jarvis, and the the goat farm person, the, the the horse and goat farm person, mini farm person, I'll be happy to bring you up to speed on those. Okay, sounds good. Sounds good. All right, Laura. Um, anything else from that I might be forgetting? <laughs> um, I don't think so. <laughs> I think we're in good shape. Um, I, I know Charles is on. Uh, Charles, do you have an update on the Long Branch, or would you be want to just kind of highlight that there's the public meeting coming up? Sure. So we have a public meeting coming up on February 11th. We've been coordinating with Laura and Judy to participate in that. And one of our big goals is, in addition to the work that Stormwater will be doing to plan restoration projects within the watershed with the many stakeholder groups in the communities that are the potential spinoff projects where we'll be working with some water conservation district and the park authority in particular through the different programs that soil and water hosts as well as the park authorities watch the green grow program which are very complementary and uh, if you're not familiar with Tammy Schaefer who's running the Watch the Green Grow program for um, Park Authority. She's also an Audubon Home Ambassador uh, within the county. She lives in the east part of the county. So uh, it's a really nice uh, complementary set between what the, the district brings and what the Park Authority brings and the many stakeholder groups. So we're really looking forward to continuing that conversation with the community. Uh, and we will be working with our our contractor about habitats on the evaluation of potential work sites that we will bring to the table uh, as part of the county project too. Um, and then I do have a couple more announcements whenever it's convenient. Now a good time or long we wait? Go ahead, since you have the floor. Okay, great. So one is and, and um, that the park authority approached um, land development services to raise the issue of promoting native seed mixes for soil and water, uh, basically erosion control. And as everybody's been aware for decades, the erosion sediment control handbook for the state has many invasive species in it. And um, but they have um, they have released supplemental guidelines that are on the DEQ website, which talk about the problems with invasive species. And native alternatives and they promote um, plant Virginia natives statewide uh, and have some really good uh, things with uh, promoting looking at the D DCR, the natural heritage invasive plant list. So all that's going on um, and so the county is we're going to prepare um, a kind of a work group that's composed of uh, staff from stormwater Urban Forestry and the Park Authority are going to draft a letter to industry that is going to be um, kind of reviewed internally in SDID for land development services. BJ Sistani is going to help host that or shepherd the process. And then we'll eventually release a letter to industry. We'll probably shop it to some of the groups, you know, the uh, engineering review folks and, and others, and probably um, maybe EQAC. And um, the tree commission, just everybody's kind of, we get the groups that kind of the big players 
to take a look at it. But again, it's just promoting use of native species and erosion control uh, as more standardized mixes and eliminating invasives specifically. Um, the um, I did want to bring on about just in conversation we just had, Laura, where you brought up and, and Dan with the Reston project that if we start to look at ways to better promote use of uh, best practices and seed mixes, that we will need to include time of year considerations and also your site prep considerations as part of those guidelines, because that makes a big difference in whether that could be successful. And then the last thing I wanted to bring up is the fact that um, I know Katie Torgerson is still working with you, Laura, and so I guess some other folks to um, bring forward stormwater funding to support the CAP program uh, to um, in, to complement the EIP component. And maybe Laura, you can speak more to that. Sorry, I have to find my, my mute button, unmute button. Um, yes, so uh, back in, we, we've talked about this for the last uh, couple of meetings um, that we've been working with stormwater planning um, and a host of others, land development services has been represented as well and maintenance and stormwater management um, to look at this establishment of a essentially a, a stormwater local assistance fund that would support the CAP program. And so a memo has been developed um, for uh, uh, um, Brian Hill, uh, County Executive Brian Hill, to take to the Board of Supervisors. And as I understand it, it will be introduced as part of uh, the budget process, um, but we will be needing to go and, and do some, um, attend some meetings like the Board of Supervisors Environmental Committee meeting. At this point, I believe we are on the agenda for March, although I have not received a confirmation about that yet. Um, so it's going to just continue to work through the process. Um, but right now we are looking at um, roughly $150,000 that would come to support these initiatives um, uh, with the VCAP program and be a local source of funds. Again, that can supplement the EIP, um, EIP funds uh, as well. So. Both the EIP and this SLAF could be in the um, county executive's budget. And so when that does come out, probably in February, we'll we'll make sure that we take a look and um, and see what's there. Um, but we, we again, there's we're sort of at the beginning of the process and uh, we are trying to move forward um, with the, the appropriate meetings and making sure that we're able to share why this is a, a good idea and um, for the county. So trying to make it easy for them to say yes. But this is a great example of you know, with the Long Branch project, um, there's some, some, again, some great synergies and efforts that are already in place. Um, and the work that we do right now with the CAP in, in trying to identify some of those targeted areas, we are already working closely with stormwater to find where there are those those locations and communities that would benefit from work up more in the uplands um, and above some of these uh, larger stormwater projects. Okay. Adrian? Yes, Jerry. Well, can I another aside? I'd, I'd like to share with uh, um, the committee. The uh, Maria came out with me, and, and uh, we looked over a park property here in Great Falls, uh, the, the uh, Grange property uh, that has a nice oak grove behind uh, behind the Grange building itself. That I've been talking with members of the, uh, the Great Falls Citizens Association's Environmental Committee about uh, doing conservation landscaping there, naturalizing the, uh, the grove. And uh, Maria pointed out some very interesting things that I'm going to include. Uh, I'm not going to take credit for them. I'm going to give Maria credit when the committee talks about this. But um, uh, she brought up a very good point. That is that if we try to turn this grove, which is currently mown, uh, so the grass, the grass is in terrible shape. It does have some natives in it that Maria pointed out to me. Uh, but it's, it, it's basically a, almost a bare, a bare understory. And I'd like to see us um, uh, take on a project to restore some of the story. Maria pointed out that uh, since there are playgrounds nearby, that um, 
landscape architects frown on having um, the whole, you know, ground to uh, canopy vegetated because of sight distances for safety purposes for kids. And that's something that I had never dawned on me, but I think it's a consideration we want to talk about with the park authority. We have not, the committee has not taken uh, a formal request to the park authority yet. I'm still working on this to figure out what the, what the proposal is going to look like. But we hope to have that approximately an acre of, uh, of this oak grove behind the uh, Grange building, um, at least not mown, and and a very very unhealthy uh, kind of a grass cover, <clears throat> uh, and, and turn it into a demonstration project for the whole community to see what natural landscaping you know could look like uh, un under a pretty, fairly heavy canopy. So I, I appreciate Maria's help on that. Um, and and we'll we'll be working on that over time. Um, Jerry, just to follow up, I'm familiar with that site, and um, it would really be good to understand the foot traffic and the ultimate goals. And to let you know, Rod Simmons, the city of Alexandria, for years has promoted native um, under under tree native lawn that naturally occurs. And I'd be happy to swing by that site too and take another look because. It's very possible a lot of those species are already present. And I, I really like your thought of it, simply not mowing potentially and allowing the species that are there to express themselves, recognizing there might be some invasive control uh, that could occur um, depending upon what, what happens. But that's a really worthy goal. I like that a lot. And there's a lot of other people that could benefit from things like poverty oats. And that's there. Uh, we found Maria found poverty oak grass and, yeah. and, some, and some native sedges were already already pretty well absolutely and there's a number of other native grasses different um different um dicantheliums that occur frequently in woodlands that are likely present and uh mosses of course can be a contributing a major contributing component but that's a really cool, cool a potential project and another thing is it complements what's going on next door at the library which has one of the longest running natural landscaping uh, projects in the county that was established as a partnership between FMD, the Great Falls Garden Club, right. and Stormwater a number of years ago, and it's still ongoing. It's a really wonderful site uh, for people to see natural landscaping at work. Yeah, absolutely. And, and I, Maria was familiar with that, uh, that project as well. Charles, whenever you have time, give me, give me a heads up. I can be over there almost any time to, to walk walk over with him and, and share your ideas. And okay. Along with what Maria's already uh, told me about. That's great. Thank you guys for bringing this forward. It looks that's really cool. Yeah, we, we've we've reached out to Tim, Tim Hackman, who is the um, uh, Park Authority uh, representative uh, on the Park Authority board representative from Gainesville. And, and so those conversations are, are about to get going. I, but I want to have something fairly Solid to say, here's here's the idea. And the Just to let you know, yeah, the park authority, it's complicated a little bit because you've got the rental property group, which runs the Grange. You've got Area 6, who oversees the management of the grounds and the playground. And then you've got the, re the natural resource group under John Burke, who probably be brought in from the natural land. So they're going to have multiple people kind of injecting their thought processes and it'd be good just to solidify the, you know, kind of the approach. And um, so, again, that'd be, it sounds like a good conversation to have. Well, I hope, hope, hope with all the, with all the institutional, um, uh, with that constraints, but I'll, things will be dealt with. Um, I'd like to see something happen there. And, and was pleased to find the, that, that the, this kind of what looks like just, Terrible short grass. I actually had a, a, a fair coverage of natives that Maria, Maria pointed out. Often the case, and I've seen a ton of those sites like that where you have really nice, uh, including my former yard, where if you just leave it be, there's tremendous native ground cover that can occur, often not tall, fairly low, and, uh, but but covering pretty much all of the ground. So, yeah, yeah my, my original idea was to turn this into forest. With all the levels, um, but I, you know, may, maybe that's a, a, a land use we're not going to be able to aspire to. 
uh, given the fact that this is fairly actively used. This, the grove itself, I don't think is particularly heavily used, but there's a very heavily used playground behind it, and then we have playing fields behind that, as, as well as a picnic area right in the middle of this grove. So I, I appreciate coming out and, and, and sharing, sharing your thoughts as, as Marie and I do. Thanks, Jerry. You bet. Okay, one more thing I just want to um, kind of touch base on. Um, I know John has another appointment, and he just sent me a message that he's he's kind of, uh, he'll, he'll meet with us uh, on Thursday. Um, just briefly, uh, Laura and I and Willie are working together with the soil, uh, excuse me, with the Food Council, the Urban Agricultural Work Group with the Fairfax Food Council um, to submit a um, NACD grant. Uh, so I probably will have more to discuss Jerry and Monica at the operations committee as we get uh, Willie and others up to speed. But I just wanted to make you aware of that, um, working with uh, the idea of trying to improve and commit to food production in some of the community garden um, areas and trying to focus on um, some mentorships and and maybe even provide some grant money for supplies or tools and, and so forth. And we'll have more details um, for you this week. Okay. That sounds exciting. Mm -hmm. I look forward to hearing about that. That's a really cool idea. Thanks. We're really excited about it too. Um, we're working with uh, some other folks that are uh, really good partners within the community. So uh, we'll have things kind of more tightened up by them. Anything else, Laura, before we kind of adjourn the meeting? Um, I just wanted to mention one other thing um, because this may be, this may come before the board this month. Uh, if, if, uh, um, if time permits, uh, but you all may recall back in October, I believe, we approved the Springfield Station project, which was an expansive impervious surface removal. They were, were, they were removing their basketball courts um, and we uh, approved their project and were able to utilize the remainder of the cap funding that we had available. Um, you might recall uh, Charles appreciate the conversations that we had about trying to find the difference. They were eligible of up to $10,000. Um, and we had roughly $5,800 remaining in, the, in our bucket for this year. We've been working with land development services. They have um, actually established a really interesting program uh, several years ago with the intent of being able to use some of the funds that they collect through compliance fees to support um, projects uh, that we might uh, have through the CAP program, um, those that are on common land or at places of worship. Uh, so with this project, um, I've been in communication with um, the environment, environmental uh, compliance coordinator, and we are working with Supervisor Herity's office to uh, consider the use of these funds as sort of the first go um, with the Springfield Station project. Uh, so they would be able to cover the di difference of um, roughly $4,800 to $4,200. Um, so we're very excited about this. So we're still working through some of the um, specifics, and I do hope to have that information uh, in, in a memorandum of agreement or understanding coming before our board uh, if uh, we want to you know, pursue that relationship further. I think it's a great um, opportunity, and, and uh, we'll certainly bring some more information forward uh, as, we, as we move along. So. I think that's it. We've got a lot coming up this month, um, and my brain is is jarbled around a little bit. But um, whatever I don't bring up today, we'll talk about next week. Um, but some of those grant opportunities, as, as Adria was mentioning, I'm looking forward to continuing to um, support. Uh, Willie is our our active member on the Urban Agricultural Work Group, and a lot of this took place while he was on leave. So I look forward to bringing you up to speed, Willie. Uh, on this and certainly getting your ideas and input into um, into the proposal. Um, but it's it's certainly exciting in ways of being able to fill some gaps in food insecurity in, in Fairfax County. Um, but uh, with that, Adria, I think that's that's all I've got for today. Okay. Um, I guess we'll take uh, anyone want to make a motion to adjourn or I can make a motion to adjourn the meeting. 
I'll second it. Okay, Monica seconded. I saw Jerry raise his hand. So uh, Jerry's in favor, Monica's in favor. All in favor? Aye, everyone. Okay, we're, uh, meeting is adjourned. Um, we're having an, an executive operations committee meeting on Thursday at 3.30, Laura. Yeah. Yeah. And so I will see Jerry and Monica at 3.30 on, on Thursday. And I hope you all have a good, good few, rest of the day. Thank you, everyone. Happy 2021. Right. Thanks, everybody. Happy New Year. On Happy New Year. <laughs> Happy New Year. <laughs> Woohoo! All right. It's like been six months, but it's only been a week. <laughs> Two. <laughs> all right. Well, I hope you all have a good rest of the day. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye, everyone. Thank you.